Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today with us. My name is Kayla Ingram, and I am a sixth year PhD candidate in the BCNB program. Futures, the university wide career design hub designed to empower all doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows across Hopkins, is thrilled to host this series. Um, devised to, prov to provide you with the critical tools and insight necessary for confidently navigating the academic job market. Today, we'll be talking about everything you need to know to prepare for academic job interviews and job talks. We'll start with a brief intro to learn more about our panelists. Then we'll begin some moderated questions to get us started. And for the last 30 minutes, we will open the floor to the audience to ask questions. Also, if you feel comfortable, you may turn on your video to interact with our speakers and other attendees. So without further ado, today we have some very great panelists. I'm super excited to have them on to talk with us today. Um, we have Dr. Thomas Kempa, an Associate Professor of Chemistry and of Materials Science and Engineering by courtesy at Johns Hopkins University. Um, his research group develops new methods to prepare and study low dimensional inorganic crystals from um, nanoparticles 0D to few atom thick sheets 2D, whose exceptional properties enable new optoelectronic energy con conversion and quantum science studies. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the DARPA Young Faculty Award, an NSF Career Award, uh, El Toshiba um, Distinguished Young Investigator Award, the Dreyfus Foundation Fellowship in Environmental Chemistry, two Hopkins Discovery Awards, and Hopkins Catalyst Award. Whew, so many awards. <laughs> and in 2003, um, he was appointed as a member of the Nano Letters Editorial Advisory Board. Next, we have uh, Dr. Ben Pierce. He is an astrobiologist currently working as a 51 Pegasi B postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Professor Sarah Horst at JHU. Next fall, Dr. Pierce will be an assistant professor and PI of the Origins and Astrobiology Research Laboratory at Purdue University. Congratulations for that. And lastly, we have Dr. Meredith McGregor, an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University after moving from a previous faculty position at the University of Colorado Boulder in August 2023. Her research group uses multi-wavelength astronomical observations to explore the formation and potential habitability of planetary systems. So let's get into some of y'all's experiences in the interview process. So can you share a brief overview of your academic job interview experience, including the types of institutions you interviewed with and any memorable moments or challenging challenges? I interviewed at two, I made two shortlists last year. I was on the job market and they were both R1 institutions, both Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Science Departments. and I ended up getting one offer from those two positions. I think the most challenging and memorable moments were definitely the on-campus interviews, which are a mental marathon. I found it particularly challenging because you, you have to be present and on for two days straight, essentially 14 hours a day, which is, is quite exhausting. Yeah. It's from, from the time they pick you up, your interview starts um, with the first person you meet. So you're thinking about you know, asking the right questions, answering questions well, making a good impression, making sure you're showcasing your research well, make sure you're explaining things well, making sure your your personality is coming out in your interactions with everyone that you meet. And you, you know, you, you do tend on having similar conversations with different people over and over. So also having the the stamina to be able to do that effectively and not kind of like taper off. So that's that was certainly the most challenging aspect. Maybe as a secondary challenging aspect was the startup negotiations and, and requests. There's not really a good like preparatory thing for that. You know, you, there's nothing really like it that you experience as a postdoc or, or a grad student, you know, starting up your own lab. What, what kind of instruments do you want? What kind of supplies do you want? Materials do you want? And also realizing that you're probably worth more than you think you are. You know, most of us aren't aren't really narcissists and we don't really think we're worth a million dollars, but these startup requests can be quite large. And when I came into my interviews, I actually got advice from a few of the people I went to dinner with, the, a few of the assistant professors, and they thought I was under 
underselling, like asking for too little. And I was simply trying to not seem too expensive because, you know, I really wanted the job. So sometimes you also have to be bold and and get some advice from people in the department as to what they can afford. Because if the university can afford a lot more than you expect, you can ask for a lot more. Okay, I guess I'm next most recent. So it's great to be here. I think I have a maybe a unique perspective in that I have done the faculty job search twice now. I don't necessarily recommend that path, but it uh, is a path that I think a lot of people end up taking. So I was, before I was a faculty member, I was a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution. So I did sort of the academic interview process getting postdoc positions. And I was working at Carnegie, which is an independent research um, laboratory. And then I did round one of faculty job searches and got two interviews and got two job offers from that. And so had the sort of interesting moment of like negotiating universities against each other and then ended up going to the University of Colorado Boulder. I was there for about three and a half years. And then because of a variety of things happening in my life at that point, it was time to find a new position. And so I did a sort of more targeted faculty search, basically only looking at two different universities. And so I did two interviews and ended up getting two jobs out of that and did the same sort of figuring out which place to choose. And now I'm here. Ben covered a lot of good points. Maybe I'll just share kind of my fun, most awkward interview question that I ever got in a faculty interview. (laughs) So I walked into a very senior professor's office and he very bluntly looked at me and said, huh, we have an enormous number of very impressive people applying for this job. Why would we ever want to hire you? And that was, you know, surprising. It's one of those questions that like, I think was totally intended to throw you for a loop and then see how you respond to it. And it's a special skill knowing that like, that's the kind of questions you get on faculty interviews and you have to have responses for those. I got the job, so it can't have gone terribly, <laughs> but there are a number of very blunt things like that. And and so my one thing that I did preparing for interviews, which I'll just like throw out here, I basically, as I was prepping for faculty interviews, would like be going about my day. And I had looked up a list of sort of like faculty interview questions and I gave them to my husband and I had him just like ask them to me at random moments throughout the day. Like we're out walking the dog questions, cooking dinner questions, so that you like get used to someone asking you very bluntly, why would we ever want to hire you? And you can come up with a response to it. Yeah. So I, let's see, at this point, so I I, I was promoted last year to tenure. So I think I, I was on the academic job market seven years ago. Not that much has changed since then from what I've heard from different friends and colleagues of mine. I mean, everything that 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 Ben and Meredith said definitely rings true. Let's see if I remember the numbers exactly. I had to look them up exactly. I, I think I submitted something like 25, 30 applications, got nine interviews and then three job offers. And then similar to Meredith's situation, sort of had to negotiate between the different options and came here and had a really exciting ride. And, you know, it's been wonderful with a great group. I would say that, you know, Ben kind of alluded to this several times when he was speaking that the process of applying when going through an academic interview is is to be subjected to the utmost scrutiny and and surveillance pretty much at all times. And that can be extraordinarily exhausting. It's also very thrilling as well, if you're willing to sort of accept it for what it is. Yeah, and, and it is definitely a marathon. You know, you have to know what kind of a personality you are. If you're a sort of person who needs stimulants like coffee to keep you through the day, then you need to titrate those and not be afraid to ask to go out for a coffee break with one of the people that you're meeting. At the same time, you need to sort of maintain a good energy level throughout. So in terms of sort of most memorable experiences, both on the good and the bad side, I think if I remember the best moment I had was having a meeting with a National Academies member, and they told me that I look very calm and composed and very relaxed throughout this entire interview process, Um, which is sort of interesting because I was anything but calm and collected basically internally, but I'm glad that they actually felt that I was essentially, that I had it all together. And then the most awkward, I think, thing that was ever said to me was after, this is a person who was actually kind of walking me back to my hotel on the, at the at the conclusion of the entire interview experience and he basically said 
yeah, you know, you are definitely like off the charts, the best person we've interviewed so far for this job, but it's unlikely that we're going to give it to you. So that was super awkward and a horrible thing to hear at the end of the, you know, I didn't have the guts to basically ask what it is about things that are going on that would make me not get a job there. Needless to say, I didn't get a job there. And I'm actually kind of glad that I didn't because I, after the fact, found out that I dodged a bullet with that particular institution. But anyway, so those are just some observations and sort of my experience. Um, and I largely applied to, actually, I exclusively applied to R1 institutions because um, I knew that the sort of research program that I wanted to build, it was either end up at an R1 institution with the resources needed or go and do something else with my life. So. Thank you all for answering that. So I'm curious to know, like, what is the process of, like, of interviews like? It seems like, you know, it's a 48-hour experience where you're talking to a lot of people. Is it like a formal interview or is it more conversational? Do you ever have to give a talk? How did you all approach that? And is it different depending on what institution you apply for? Like for our one institutions, is that different from a liberal arts institution where would it be more formal than our one institution? Everything you said is is, is correct. I mean, that it, it does vary a little bit, but generally speaking, if you're interviewing in the sciences and the STEM fields, then typically you're going to give two talks over the day and a half to two days that you're out, you're visiting. And so one of the talks is a, a general seminar that you give to the whole department, which just really much pretty much talks about your previous research so that they understand where you're coming from. And then the second talk that you usually give is a proposal talk or prop talk. And that's where you actually talk about what it is that you propose to do in your own independent research program. And that's the really big one, to be honest, the, you know, the 45, 50 minute sort of seminar that you give, it's kind of you have to know that cold. I mean, it's your own work. You're basically playing from a position of strength and that's the talk you, everyone nails for the most part. The tough one is always the proposal talk because that can, especially if we're talking about stamina, that's where you need to be awake for two hours and be ready to receive constant sort of interruptions and critiques to try to get through the three to four different core aspects of your research program. And one other thing I'll comment and then I'll let my, the other panelists sort of contribute the format of the visit can be a little bit different. I mean, sometimes you arrive in the evening, the day before you have a full day. And in that full day, you'll have meetings all day, plus maybe your seminar in the afternoon and then dinner with the committee, the search committee members. And then the second day, which usually could be a half day, you have your proposal talk first thing in the morning and then maybe a few other meetings after lunch. And then you're dismissed and you can take your flight back to wherever you need to go. Um, again, there are variations on this theme, but roughly speaking, that's kind of the architecture of what, that's what the days look like, and roughly speaking, the talks you're expected to give. Yeah, I can jump in. I think that actually maybe the format of this li listening, there's some things that ring true for me too, but I think even in the sciences, this varies by field. In like my experience applying in astronomy and physics departments, usually, and I, I should also add, I only applied to R1 institutions as well. I only ever had to give one formal talk, which was like a full department colloquium. That part about like your proposal for your independent research came in like one of two forms. Sometimes departments would have you have a formal interview where they would have the entire search committee sit in a room with you and then ask you these questions. And all of that was meant to cover sort of your proposal for what you would do with your research group and how you would get funding. But you're being asked that in sort of a smaller setting, not to the entire department, just the search committee. And some departments didn't actually ever have you sit down formally with the search committee. They instead had you do this one-on-one, -on -one, on one, on one, like two full days. So I've had both. <laughs> I think I actually prefer the one where you just sit down and do it once rather than having to do the same pitch of yourself every like half hour for two full days. But that was sort of that structure. I've also in pretty much every department I've interviewed in at some point, you also have to have lunch with the graduate students. And then usually there's some kind of either combined with that or separate like formal meeting with the graduate students as well, where they get to ask you questions or formally interview you. That may vary by department, but in general, there are grad students who are consulted in the search process. And so the grad students get to have an opinion on whether you would be a good advisor or a terrible advisor or not. Um, I'm trying to think what else happens. I do know uh, that in non R1, like if you're applying for jobs that are more teaching focused, then usually you have to do a teaching demonstration as well. 
um, which is like a second talk where you would actually, they'll give you a topic in advance and then you would have to actually prepare a short lecture and present it to the department. I'll just add a little bit that wasn't mentioned. Usually there's also a, a talk with the, or a, a meeting with the associate dean of some kind where you can ask questions about the tenure process and the tenure rate in the department and also about the science because, you know, the dean also does science. So, you know, about their their research and, and anything you need to know uh, or want to know about the vision of the university as a whole and the department as a whole so that you can kind of mention these sorts of things in, in other meetings. I was lucky. I only had to give one talk for both of my interviews and they were sort of a research slash proposal talk where, you know, the majority of the time was talking about past research, but then the last 10 minutes or so was introducing the research that would be done in my lab if I was given the the offer. And I had one set of uh, interviews that was more informal, just one-on-ones, and another one where there was an exit interview where there was a formal component where I had to ask, answer kind of formal interview questions So kind of different vibes, but overall, really the same process, just done slightly differently. So what strategies um, and best practices do you recommend for creating an engaging and memorable job talk presentation that effectively communicates your research and proposal or teaching abilities? Do a good job at storytelling. You know, we're as humans, we like stories. I've attended a lot of science communication workshops, which I highly recommend if you want to improve at that. And it's really all about improving the story that you're trying to portray, make it interesting, use colorful language. I started a job talk with Once Upon a Time, and that's completely allowed. (laughs) And it is also engaging for the audience because they hear that triggers in their brain, oh, the story's coming, and they get get interested right away. So these are sorts of things you can do. But yeah, it's it's also a talk, this is what Tom mentioned, it's a talk you've given you know, dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, versions of of it throughout conferences and seminars and everything. So as long as you're iteratively improving your talk every time you give it, you know, looking for one thing you can improve, it's getting better and better. And that's why, as Tom mentioned, most people nail that talk is because you've all been giving it so many times. I can say, I mean, I, a few couple of things that come to mind because when I was interviewing, I only ever gave one talk. I got the advice that you sort of want to balance three things in your talk. You want to give maybe a third to like background material, a third to like your current research and a third to what you are going to do if you come to the department. And the reasons for trying to split it that way are you're applying to a department and probably they don't necessarily have anybody who does exactly what you do. Because if they already had a ton of people who did your research, they probably wouldn't be hiring in your area and you wouldn't be being interviewed there. So your task is to like go into this department and convince everybody there who does their own research that yours is actually the coolest, most amazing thing that you have ever thought of doing. And that means you have to give them enough background and pitch it at a level that like you bring along everybody who's not an expert in your field. And then you also make them really excited for why they would want to have you there. So there's some kind of balancing act in like doing that. And as a result, I found that, you know, while I have given tons and tons and tons and tons of colloquia to hit that balance right is a little bit of a different talk than I might normally give if I'm just giving a colloquium in a department and I don't want to convince them to hire me. And I will say like, definitely practice it. I have also now been on a bunch of hiring committees and not everybody nails this talk. (laughs) which is a blunt thing to say, but it really can make or break like your application because it is, you know, at least in physics and astronomy, like the one time you get up there and everybody in the department sees you. And if you don't nail this talk, that will definitely sink your interview. So it's worth like spending some time practicing it, practice it on your friends or your partner or your parents or someone who isn't an expert in your field. So you get the chance to sort of see what you're saying that sails right over everybody's head and where you might need to work on things. So I'd I'd say, you know, don't overestimate just how well the people in your audience know what you have to say. That's actually kind of a really important thing to get across because, you know, when you're a grad student and a postdoc, you 
I always say to my students that you enter a PhD with a very like a you know bright eyed and bushy tailed with a lot of exciting ideas about how the world works, and then you become one's world, the world's sole expert on one particular area of science, which is wonderful. But then it becomes extraordinarily important to sort of branch out and actually see the greater context within which your research resides. And I'm saying this because <clears throat> I was even guilty of this, that my intros I thought were, I, I was almost allergic to the idea of making the intros as simple and easily digestible as possible, because I didn't want to, and I kept on going through this refrain in my head, I didn't want to insult the intelligence of my audience, because I overestimated how knowledgeable and how well and whatever well informed they are about the area and then i learned over time and thanks to sort of feedback from some colleagues and friends of mine at the time that actually know that it's okay almost as ben said to sort of and meredith as well to you know start with a, a get your get yourself into a narrative cadence as soon as possible and start simple and it's okay then to get very, very technical and detailed, right? You need to show the gamut of capability, right? So there, it's not only important in a good talk to start simple to, to sort of, you know, draw people into your vision, and to, but it's also important to show the breadth at which you can operate both at the very high conceptual level and also at the very detailed technical level. And then the second thing I'll just mention, which is actually has three parts, is that in any talk, usually the faculty, again, also having served on dozens of committees at this point, are looking for kind of three things. One, they're looking for an exciting idea, right, that differentiates you from the faculty in the department, as Meredith pointed out. The second thing they want to know is they want to know that they want to be able to hook into something that you do, right? I mean, they want to see some at least way in which they can relate to your work. So they have to be excited by the idea and the fact that it's new and fresh, but they also want to, your colleagues want to know that there's some way in which you fit into the department and into the ethos of what's done in that department. And that's because, you know, at the end of the day, these colleagues, if they're going to promote you in the end, are going to still have to be able to sort of champion you, advocate for you, and ultimately decide whether they want to go out for letters to promote you. So it's important for them to, and they're also thinking about the long-term interests of the department and how it can grow and, and continue to flourish in the areas of strength. And the last third thing that you need to really get across is whether you can connect to the greater community and whether you are essentially not only able to make impact in your research area, but also, you know, can plausibly succeed in that area in terms of grantsmanship, right? Raising funds is also very important that we, most scientists hate raising funds, I, right? We would prefer to be talking about experiments and writing papers, but the reality is it's something we need to do. So the other thing that faculty are always looking at, aside from the idea and how it, you coupled into the de department is whether you have a plausible research program that will excite a critical mass of people and and funding sources. So just think about those three or so things that you need to hit in a talk and convince people, and that's usually successful. So what are some common mistakes people make, and how can those be avoided in the interview process? Do you mean mistakes in the talk or just mistakes in general? In general, oh. both the talk and in the interviews. I mean, in the talk, the biggest thing I've seen is people like not giving that sort of narrative introduction. I, I've seen these talks where people just dive really deep into something very specific and they kind of lose the entire audience right away. That's not, you know, you don't want to lose your audience. I have also seen some, I mean, one, one thing I saw in a job talk once, which I think I would advise against is someone decided every five slides to put in a cute picture of them with an animal, which was a you know nice break. And I think some people in the audience thought it was endearing, but there were enough people in that audience that thought that was unprofessional. And the very last thing you want to do is give a job talk to an academic institution and come across as unprofessional. In the actual like interview process, I have also, you know, I think, one thing that's important is like you submitted a bunch of material in advance, writing about your teaching plans and your service plans and your research plans and how you're going to fund things. And I have seen people through some combination of nerves or not practicing it, come into an interview and get asked questions about those documents and then completely say different things than were in your actual application materials. That comes across as being extremely unprepared 
and you know it's probably just something happening but it produced a lot of discussion on that hiring panel about how this person wasn't who they really were trying to portray themselves as i can add so i read this book before i did my interviews by karen kelsky called the professor is in which highly recommend reading if you want to get like a just a great overview of the entire process of the applying for faculty jobs and interviewing and et cetera. Uh, and one she, thing she mentioned in her book was, was don't bring graduate student energy to your interviews. You know, they're looking for someone who's going to be a colleague, a collaborator, someone who they will write grants with. And if you come in kind of treating them like your mentors rather than your colleagues, then, then that could maybe put a sour taste in their mouth in terms of whether you're ready for that position or not. And, you know, we all have imposter syndrome and don't feel like we're ready for these positions, but, you know, you, you still have to try to present yourself as though you belong there. And the kicker is you do actually belong there, even if you don't think you do, but you just have to make sure that you're, you're coming across more professorial than, than grad student energy. And I, I took that to heart in my interviews. I guess one mistake that you know, I've seen actually happen twice is to have an applicant be a little bit too flippant about the status of the field in that particular field that they were applying in. You know, it's, it's important to do your homework. I mean, yes, especially if you're proposing to do things that are in a field that is a little bit different from the one that you did your postdoc and PhD work, by the way, that's always a good thing, right? You should always be, you know, that's actually a, a topic of conversation unto itself, in my opinion, you know, how how does, how much should one sort of pivot from their comfortable areas of research versus versus stay in the same area? But anyway, the point is that, you know, just be very, you know, if you're going to make a very strong emphatic statement about the status of a field, whether it's, you know, ultimately a dead, where whether this subfield is a dead end and it needs new innovation or not, make sure you are absolutely certain and ready to sort of defend that point if you're called on it. If you are called on it, especially by someone who you might not fully appreciate as an expert in that space, this is where it's important to also do your homework about the department that you're interviewing at and make sure you know where people are coming from. If you're called on it and you don't have a good answer, then you're really screwed at that point. So I don't, I wouldn't recommend, you know, I wouldn't say that you should just be sort of circumspect about everything, you know, because then that shows that you're sort of undecisive and not really willing to take a stand, but just be, just be careful. Like, you know, choose your battles wisely. If you really firmly are of the opinion that this one field is in desperate need of innovation and that the, otherwise it'll die off, then, you know, elaborate on that point a little bit more, but just, yeah, just be be cognizant that there are a lot of egos in science, surprise, surprise, and they can get wounded very easily. So best come to a knife fight in, you know, in the right way, so to speak. I feel like that's a really good point. Like do your homework on the department before you go there. I mean, every time I was visiting someplace, I looked up every single person at the department and what they did and what their most recent papers were. So I was like yep. somewhat prepared for what they might come at me with. Yep. Even even the people that you don't end up interviewing with, it's a good idea just to get an idea. So yeah, absolutely. And I know that's not easy, right? That's in a 50 person department, like <laughs> a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but you know, exactly. So we are past the half hour mark. So if anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. We would love to hear from you as well. Is there anyone there? If you're not comfortable with sharing by unmuting yourself, just put it in the chat and I will ask the question for you. Thank you, Grace, for asking our first audience question. So what sort of questions are you are useful to ask your prospective colleagues to help you determine whether the position is a good fit? I've got a great one. I got this advice from someone else and I used it and it worked like a charm. So it's actually asked during my long list interviews on, over Zoom. So usually there's a you get a 30 minute Zoom interview before you make it onto the short list. And when they asked for uh, questions from me, I asked, what is everyone's favorite thing about working in the department? And the reason this is such a good question is not only does it show your interest for the department and the institution, but it's uh, a potential red flag exposure. And on one of the uh, committees, the job that I didn't end up getting, one of the 
committee members said, I declined to answer that question and you can read into that however you want. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't know what to think about at the time. I, I later found out that there's some interpersonal conflict between a few of the faculty in that department. So it kind of exposed that to me and kind of lets you know what the health of the department is in terms of the professors. So I think it makes a really good question. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say through like learned experience, having been in one faculty job and now moving to a different one, it sort of the experience of being in a faculty job is where you finally learn like what you should have asked before you have shown up at this job. And so I, the second time around, asked lots of questions about like, how are teaching assignments set about? And if you teach a new class, how many times do you get to reteach it? And what is the typical service load like? Because there are a number of departments out there that really like to overload their junior faculty with a lot of extra stuff and make it hard for you to function and do the research that you really want to do. And it's hard to sort of suss that out unless you really like ask that point blank of a bunch of junior faculty members and see how they're doing in the department. I mean, it's also sometimes, you know, good to ask if, if a department has any particular, you know, vision to grow certain divisions or, you know, subfields over the next five to six, whatever, seven years, as long as your potential tenure in the department might last. That's usually helpful to know. And it, it gets at two things. One, whether the department has been thoughtful enough to be having these internal discussions about what they want to, how they want to chart the future of the department, right? Um, and the second thing is it's directly relevant to you as the applicant, because then you can find out whether you're going to be an island, right? Especially if you're someone that they're hiring for the first time in that space, it's a kind of polite way of asking, you know, or polite way of assessing for yourself, whether you're going to be an island or whether there's going to be a critical mass of people that might be developed around you in the associated facilities. Are there any more questions from the audience? I do have a question. So earlier, I, you know, I heard Tom say that he had like nine different offers. Meredith said she was choosing between two. And Ben um, said that he, you know, like Ben is the new faculty member. So I'm curious to know what went into, into the decision between these faculty positions. Like what made you decide, yeah, this is the place I want to be? Good question. I think I had different things both times. The first time when I was deciding between the two places, they were both you know, R1, good state schools. So, you know, on paper, relatively similar. And then ultimately, I was deciding, A, because I have a husband who is a physicist, and he also needed a job. <laughs> and we were trying to figure out where we were going to actually like solve a two body problem. And that is a totally valid thing to decide and ask once you are actually like have a faculty job, you are allowed to ask them while you're negotiating for help solving that problem. So it was a combination of that. And also one of them, you know, was willing to offer me more resources than the other. And I do think that having the two offers made a difference there. When you have one offer, you can definitely still negotiate, but in my experience, you have less negotiating power than if somebody that the school you're negotiating with views as competition is like wanting you as well. And the second time around, another thing that kind of came in ultimately was actually department culture. One of the places that I had an offer at, I just was not getting a good vibe working with the chair of that department who was raising all sorts of red flags. And since declining that offer, I've seen even more red flags pop up. So I'm very grateful I made that decision. But it was this kind of like feeling out department culture and like, what is it going to be like to actually have to work with you on a day-to-day -day basis? For me, it came down to facilities and resources, you know, on the, on, on the career side. You know, I as I said, I did apply to R1s for no other reason than, than knowing that the scale of the program that I wanted to build was such that it would really only be able to function at a university that could give that where the startup package could be commensurate with what was needed. But but yeah, but it came down to facilities being fairly close to sort of national facilities or reasonably close to national facilities was also really important to me. And then on the private side, I also had a two body problem. I had a partner who had recently accepted a position to work for the at the time the Obama administration so that definitely constrained things a little bit but again as Meredith said so you're completely allowed to have that factor into your decision making this is not 
this is an it's an incredible privilege to have the job of being an academic. It's extraordinarily tough and stressful, and you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So you damn well better be at least happy in other areas of your life, to, or at least somewhat grounded in other areas of your life, because you're going to need that support. And then, yeah, I, I think one of the other institutions I looked at, I also had just got bad vibes from simply put too. It's just, I still remembered, you know, I didn't think that I would get an offer from that one institution that did end up giving me, apparently they were, I was the first one they gave an offer to. I don't quite believe that, but I just remembered the way that the faculty had raised questions that were not particularly, I felt constructive or professional during my proposal talk. And I just said like, hey, you know what, this is a department where I would join being a bit of an outsider and a bit of an island. And, you know, it's not a department that I would necessarily be, want to be part of. Yeah, I had it easy in the sense that I only had one offer, but I I am on a pretty good postdoctoral fellowship. So I could have just not accepted, I guess, and continued my postdoc for a couple of years. So there were a few things that went into the decision. And, and the major thing was, are the professors and the students in the department happy? And it's not something you can hide. So during my on-campus interviews, I really just, through conversation, was able to assess, you know, whether people are happy there or not. You know, do they like their job? Do they like the community? Is the department cohesive? Do the professors and students communicate? And at Purdue, they really do. And the professors are really happy and it just shows. So it's kind of a glimpse into your future, I feel like, if you if you can see happy faculty then you can see that for your future. And I was, that was really my main deciding factor. The other thing was, I want to feel, you know, valued. And that's something that they really did well. You know, they were really interested in my research. I was really interested in theirs. I think, you know, the main reason why I ended up getting the offer was because during my one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the different professors, we could come up with pro research projects like that. I must have had, I must have come away with six or seven different research project ideas with different professors. There's just so many opportunities for us to collaborate. Whereas at the other place, I didn't, I didn't come away with any. And actually that was the piece of feedback I got um, from not getting that job was that it didn't, they, they didn't think that there was a lot of opportunities for me to collaborate with other faculty in the department. And that's, that's totally a reasonable thing you know they want someone who they can write grants with who who they can work with and you know it was just i was a more natural fit for for this other department so you know and that's not always something you can manufacture you're either your research is either a good fit or maybe it won't be but you can certainly try your best to bring that out by by researching different faculty in advance and trying to think up you know potential projects and and questions you can ask to see if you can get ideas flowing so just, there's only one thing I, I just wanted to like add like a small, like star caveat onto that. And that like, I think that really depends on the culture of the department, because I have also absolutely interacted with departments that they very much want to bring you in, not because they necessarily want to collaborate with you, which they might eventually, but that because they view you as like, you are the person that works on X, Y, or Z that they need to like bring in to sort of, you know, stamp collect in their department and that they are bringing you in specifically because you do something so totally cool and new and different and like you're the star in it and they really want to have you there and so that I think really depends on like the culture of the department and how they function like are they a department where everybody works together or are they some of these like departments that very much have a bunch of like superstar faculty who are their own little silos and that's also then a choice for you like what kind of department do you actually want to be in Another question from the chat. For job applications, it's encouraged to identify potential collaborators. Is it a good idea to reference them during a, a job talk? I'm going to, so that's a good question. I'm going to say calling them out in a job. My opinion is in a job talk, it's not a good idea because it can seem like you're basically being, it, it, would, it would make you seem unintentionally that you'd be trying to be a sycophant basically. And I think you want to avoid that. I think the most effective way of doing it is if you have any say in who you might want to meet with when you do interview, make sure that you request that you meet with them and then have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation with them to have a more detailed discussion about why you're excited about their research and super excited about this paper or these papers that they wrote X number of years ago and how it connects to your work. But I think in the context of a talk, it can seem a little bit 
in my opinion, a little on the nose. I would not do it personally. Yeah, I wouldn't do it in a talk. I think you can put it in an application like package when you're writing a statement. But I got very strong advice when I was doing this that if you do that, you have to be sort of careful in how you frame it. Because for most places, they really want you to come in and like be the PI and lead a whole new area. So this is the like, don't give off grad student vibes, I guess. And that if you say I'm coming in to collaborate with X, Y, and Z, and I really look forward to working with them, then it doesn't seem as strong as a statement of like you coming in and doing your own thing. And so you can sort of say something along the lines of, you know, like professors X and Y work in this particular area. And my research is like a really great addition to the department because it's complementary in some way, which kind of like, you know, makes those people feel good and shows that there might be collaboration, but really shows that you're like bringing in something new. So it's like framing it in a way that highlights you. I, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I had a slide called opportunities for collaborations in the department. <laughs> and I, I'd list like a topic, like biosignatures, and then I would write the professors who work on biosignatures in the department, just like kind of as like a, a list of names and topics and like opportunities to talk to me about um, these things during my visit. So for better or worse, it ended up working out. There are always exceptions to the rule. Yeah. That's bad. There are different departments and they have different cultures. Another question in the chat from Emiliano, what is the timeline of the process from the first phone call, the visit, interview, getting an offer, how long does one have to give a response in case of getting that offer? Really long. Yeah, it is really long. So long. I think it might vary by field, but at least in physics and astronomy, applications are usually due sometime in the fall, like probably starting between like October and December. And then I don't think I ever heard back from anybody for any kind of anything until like January. And then maybe you'd have interviews in like February and March. And then like by April or something, you've got an offer if they're being fast, maybe by early May. And then it really depends on the university in terms of how long they let you play with that offer once you have it. I have had universities behave in very different ways here. Some of them like to set deadlines, you know, two weeks or something to try and make you make decisions quickly. And some places take a very different approach, which is just like, we really want to have you here. Take as long as you want. Come visit us again. That was much more pleasant. I found that more rare, but it really kind of depends on the university. So at that point, I think, you know, you're probably gone from October all the way through like May before you've actually gone through the entire process. So it's like the better part of most of a year. There's a bit of a boundary condition on sometimes, sometimes a legitimate boundary condition that universities will put on how much time they give you to accept an offer. Because if you do want to come in July of that year, to be fair, they do need to have time to renovate space, labs. That, I mean, sometimes that always, by the way, you know, elephant in the room, your lab space especially if you're more instrument heavy, is never going to be ready the first day that you move in on July 1. <laughs> it never, it never happens. You're lucky if basically everything's set up by September. But anyway, the point is that, yeah, I mean, I can, I, I apply to chemistry, physics, and some engineering departments. And applications can, for chemistry, have a tendency to be due by October 1 or so. You find out about interviews just before Thanksgiving. Sometimes you'll start doing interviews in December. Usually you're done with interviews by the end of January and you get offers in March or so um, ish. Right. So anyway, it's 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 a spit of it, 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 and engineering schools have a tendency to push everything by two months. But that's typically the process. Yeah. I'll just add that it's fairly common also to for new faculty to defer their start date by anywhere from four months for to a year I'm deferring for a year just because I feel like I I want the transitionary time to ease myself into the role which has turned out really great because I've you know I've interviewed over 30 prospective PhD students so far well I'm while well, I'm still a postdoc I can work on lab renovations before I arrive and I can just kind of prepare I can even prepare a course over the summer 
before I arrive and and do my my one half course requirement for fall instead of winter. Of course, you need postdoc funding to be able to do that. So I'm I'm privileged to to be able to have that transitionary funding to 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 enable me to do that. But you know, all all three of the incoming Purdue faculty have deferred for a year in my year, and then the sixth year prior, all six deferred for a year as well. So I mean, at least at Purdue, it's almost 100% of people do this. So something to think about if you end up getting an offer. Thank you all. We have time for one more question in, in the audience. If anyone has any, please unmute, add it to the chat. Um, but I do, I do, I think I could fill in a question. So yes, hearing from you all, I, I'm, I'm hearing that you know this process is anxiety-inducing and it can be stressful and exhausting. So what are some things, what are some, what's some advice or what are some things that you all did to manage that stress and that anxiety during the interview process? Find a good group of friends that you can vent to on a regular basis. You know, because, you know, some, some people don't like to see people in very, don't like to see people in very raw states, you know, like, you know, when they're very strung out, exhausted and frustrated. So yeah, just, you know, find a good group of people that you can just vent to you know, have a glass of wine or scotch with and just say how annoyed you were or how excited you were basically in, in equal terms, hopefully by the, the experience. I think that's important. You should, you shouldn't suffer in silence because then you just stew and then you get, then, then only bad things happen. And that's in general true. Try to get that sleep as much as you possibly can. I did, and I wouldn't do this again, but I did book two interviews back to back in the same week and they were both uh, they were on opposite coasts. So I remember flying out on a Sunday to have a Monday, Tuesday experience and then flew out Wednesday morning back to the, sorry, no, Tuesday evening to get back to the East Coast for, you know, another Wednesday trip immediately. Like literally I had enough time to dump my bags at the dry cleaner and grab a fresh bag basically to go. I did that twice and I would not recommend it. It was too much. So, you know, just try to be, just be careful and and, and preserve your bandwidth. Yeah, I think what things, I mean, maybe I'll say something specific, like when you're on interviews, don't be shy about asking for what you need and like going to the bathroom. And <laughs> like, sounds like a really basic thing, but it has a tendency when you're at these interviews for like you to meet with one faculty member and then they walk you to the next faculty member's office and then they walk you to the next faculty member's office and then suddenly you're at lunch and you're like, wait, I have to go to the bathroom. So don't actually be shy about that and just go totally fine. No one can judge you for that. And also your days will be totally packed with meetings and dinners and stuff, but like take time outside of that for you. I really like running. So I would wake up in the morning and just like go for a run before the interview starts. It's also a nice way to see where you might actually end up living if this interview works out and you actually end up taking this job do something in the evening to like decompress, like take time for you. Yeah, I'll just second what Meredith said. I, I use exercise as a way to center myself. Don't let that slip, you know, when you're preparing for the weeks before and even when you are on your your interviews. You know, I went to the the hotel gym to lift every night and it really makes a difference just in my ability to show up, be present. And, you know, whether whatever that is for you, if it's meditation, running, yoga, just make sure you're you're keeping it up when it matters the most. You know, it's easy to do that stuff when you're not stressed out, but you got to do it when you are. Well, thank you all so much for your thoughtful and insightful advice. We hope that everyone joining us today was able to get their questions answered. This was such a valuable experience for me as the moderator. So I'm super appreciative uh, that you all were able to join us today. So truly, thank you all again for all of your support and, the, um, and supporting the academic job search series this fall. So have a great afternoon.